Chapter 4. Camping Among the Tombs. October 9. After going again to the express office and post office, and wandering about the streets, I found a road which led me to the Bonaventure graveyard. If that burying ground across the Sea of Galilee, mentioned in Scripture, was half as beautiful as Bonaventure, I do not wonder that a man should dwell among the tombs. It is only three or four miles from Savannah, and is reached by a smooth white shell road. There is but little to be seen on the way in land, water, or sky that would lead one to hope for the glories of Bonaventure. The ragged, desolate fields, on both sides of the road, are overrun with coarse, rank weeds, and show scarce a trace of cultivation. But soon all is changed. Rickety log huts, broken fences, and the last patch of weedy rice stubble are left behind. You come to beds of purple liatris and living wildwood trees. You hear the song of birds, cross a small stream, and are with nature in the grand old forest graveyard, so beautiful that almost any sensible person would choose to dwell here with the dead rather than with the lazy, disorderly living. Part of the grounds was cultivated and planted with live oak about a hundred years ago by a wealthy gentleman who had his country residence here, but much the greater part is undisturbed. Even those spots which are disordered by art, nature is ever at work to reclaim, and to make them look as if the foot of man had never known them. Only a small plot of ground is occupied with graves, and the old mansion is in ruins. The most conspicuous glory of Bonaventure is its noble avenue of live oaks. They are the most magnificent planted trees I have ever seen, about fifty feet high and perhaps three or four feet in diameter, with broad spreading leafy heads. The main branches reach out horizontally until they come together over the driveway, embowering it throughout its entire length, while each branch is adorned like a garden with ferns, flowers, grasses, and dwarf palmettos. But of all the plants of these curious tree gardens, the most striking and characteristic is the so-called long moss, Talancia usnioides. It drapes all the branches from top to bottom, hanging in long silvery-gray skeins, reaching a length of not less than eight or ten feet, and when slowly waving in the wind, they produce a solemn, funereal effect, singularly impressive. There are also thousands of smaller trees and clustered bushes, covered almost from sight in the glorious brightness of their own light. The place is half surrounded by the salt marshes and islands of the river, their reeds and sedges making a delightful fringe. Many bald eagles roost among the trees along the side of the marsh. Their screams are heard every morning, joined with the noise of crows and the song of countless warblers, hidden deep in their dwellings of leafy bowers. Large flocks of butterflies, all kinds of happy insects, seem to be in a perfect fever of joy and sportive gladness. The whole place seems like a center of life. The dead do not reign there alone. Bonaventure, to me, is one of the most impressive assemblages of animal and plant creatures I ever met. I was fresh from the western prairies, the garden-like openings of Wisconsin, the beech and maple and oak woods of Indiana and Kentucky, the dark, mysterious Savannah cypress forests, but never since I was allowed to walk the woods have I found so impressive a company of trees as the Tillandsia-draped oaks of Bonaventure. I gazed awe-stricken as one new arrived from another world. Bonaventure is called a graveyard, a town of the dead, but the few graves are powerless in such a depth of life. The rippling of living waters, the song of birds, the joyous confidence of flowers, the calm, undisturbable grandeur of the oaks mark this place of graves as one of the lord's most favored abodes of life and light on no subject are our ideas more warped and pitiable than on death instead of the sympathy the friendly union of life and death so apparent in nature we are taught that death is an accident a deplorable punishment for the oldest sin the arch enemy of life etc Town children, especially, are steeped in this death orthodoxy, for the natural beauties of death are seldom seen or taught in towns. Of death among our own species, to say nothing of the thousand styles and modes of murder, our best memories, even among happy deaths, yield groans and tears, mingled with morbid exultation. Burial companies, black in cloth and countenance, and, last of all, a black box burial in an ill-omened place, haunted by imaginary glooms and ghosts of every degree. 
thus death becomes fearful and the most notable and incredible thing heard around a deathbed is i fear not to die but let children walk with nature let them see the beautiful blendings and communions of death and life their joyous inseparable unity as taught in woods and meadows plains and mountains and streams of our blessed star and they will learn that death is stingless indeed and is beautiful as life and that the grave has no victory for it never fights all is divine harmony most of the few graves of bonaventure are planted with flowers there is generally a magnolia at the head near the strictly erect marble a rose bush or two at the foot and some violets and showy exotics along the sides or on the tops all is enclosed by a black iron railing composed of rigid bars that might have been spears or bludgeons from a battlefield in pandemonium it is interesting to observe how assiduously nature seeks to remedy these labored art blunders she corrodes the iron and marble and gradually levels the hill which is always heaped up as if a sufficiently heavy quantity of clods could not be laid on the dead arching grasses come one by one seeds come flying on downy wings silent as fate to give life's dearest beauty for the ashes of art and strong evergreen arms laden with ferns and talancia drapery are spread over all life at work everywhere obliterating all memory of the confusion of man in georgia many graves are covered with a common shingle roof supported on four posts as the cover of a well as if rain and sunshine were not regarded as blessings perhaps in this hot and insalubrious climate moisture and sun-heat are considered necessary evils to which they do not wish to expose their dead the money package that i was expecting did not arrive until the following week after stopping the first night at the cheap disreputable looking hotel i had only about a dollar and a half left in my purse and so was compelled to camp out to make it last in buying only bread i went out of the noisy town to seek a sleeping place that was not marshy after gaining the outskirts of the town toward the sea i found some low sand dunes yellow with flowering sundagos i wandered wearily from dune to dune sinking ankle-deep in the sand searching for a place to sleep beneath the tall flowers free from insects and snakes and above all for my fellow-man but idle negroes were prowling about everywhere and i was afraid the wind had strange sounds waving the heavy panicles over my head and i feared sickness from malaria so prevalent here when i suddenly thought of the graveyard there thought i is an ideal place for a penniless wanderer there no superstitious prowling mischief-maker dares venture for fear of haunting ghosts while for me there will be god's rest and peace and then if i am to be exposed to unhealthy vapours i shall have capital compensation in seeing those grand oaks in the moonlight with all the impressive and nameless influences of this lonely beautiful place by this time it was near sunset and i hastened across the common to the road and set off for bonaventure delighted with my choice and almost glad to find that necessity had furnished me with so good an excuse for doing what i knew my mother would censure for she made me promise i would not lie out of doors if i could possibly avoid it the sun was set ere i was past the negroes huts and rice fields and i arrived near the graves in the silent hour of the gloaming i was very thirsty after walking so long in the muggy heat a distance of three or four miles from the city to get to this graveyard a dull sluggish coffee-coloured stream flows under the road just outside the graveyard garden park from which i managed to get a drink after breaking away down to the water through the dense fringe of bushes daring the snakes and alligators in the dark thus refreshed i entered the weird and beautiful abode of the dead all the avenue where i walked was in shadow but an exposed tombstone frequently shone out in startling whiteness on either hand and thickets of sparkleberry bushes gleamed like heaps of crystals not a branch of air moved the grey moss and the great black arms of the trees met overhead and covered the avenue but the canopy was fissured by many a netted seam and leafy edged opening through which the moonlight sifted in auroral rays broidering the blackness in silvery light though tired i sauntered a while enchanted then lay down under one of the great oaks i found a little mound that served for a pillow placed my plant press and bag beside me and rested fairly well though somewhat disturbed by large prickly-footed beetles creeping across my hands and face and by a lot of hungry stinging mosquitoes 
When I awoke, the sun was up and all nature was rejoicing. Some birds had discovered me as an intruder and were making a great ado in interesting language and gestures. I heard the screaming of the bald eagles and of some strange waders in the rushes. I heard the hum of savannah with the long jarring halloos of negroes far away. On rising, I found that my head had been resting on a grave, and though my sleep had been not quite so sound as that of the person below, I arose refreshed, and looking about me, the morning sunbeams pouring through the oaks and gardens dripping with dew, the beauty displayed was so glorious and exhilarating that hunger and care seemed only a dream. Eating a breakfast cracker or two, and watching for a few hours the beautiful lights, birds, squirrels, and insects, I returned to Savannah to find that my money package had not yet arrived. I then decided to go early to the graveyard and make a nest with a roof to keep off the dew, as there was no way of finding out how long I might have to stay. I chose a hidden spot in a dense thicket of sparkleberry bushes, right near the bank of the Savannah River, where the bald eagles and a multitude of singing birds roosted. It was so well hidden that I had to carefully fix its compass bearing in my mind from a mark I had made on the side of the main avenue that I might be able to find it at bedtime. I used four of the bushes as corner posts for my little hut, which was about four or five feet long by about three or four feet in width, tied little branches across from forks in the bushes to support a row of rushes, and spread a thick mattress of long moss over the floor for a bed. My whole establishment was on so small a scale that I could have taken up not only my bed but my whole house and walked. There I lay that night, eating a few crackers. Next day I returned to the town and was disappointed as usual in obtaining money. So after spending the day looking at the plants in the gardens of the fine residences and town squares, I returned to my graveyard home. That I might not be observed and suspected of hiding, as if I had committed a crime, I always went home after dark, and one night, as I lay down in my moss nest, I felt some cold-blooded creature in it, whether a snake or simply a frog or toad I do not know, but instinctively, instead of drawing back my hand, I grasped the poor creature and threw it over the tops of the bushes. That was the only significant disturbance or fright that I got. In the morning everything seemed divine. Only squirrels, sunbeams, and birds came about me. I was awakened every morning by these little singers after they discovered my nest. Instead of serenely singing their morning songs, they at first came within two or three feet of the hut and— looking in at me through the leaves, chattered and scolded in half-angry, half-wondering tones. The crowd constantly increased, attracted by the disturbance. Thus I began to get acquainted with my bird neighbors in this blessed wilderness, and after they learned that I meant them no ill, they scolded less and sang more. After five days of this graveyard life, I saw that even with living on three or four cents a day, my last twenty-five cents would soon be spent, and after trying again and again unsuccessfully to find some employment, began to think that I must strike farther out into the country, but still within reach of town, until I came to some grain or rice field that had not yet been harvested, trusting that I could live indefinitely on toasted or raw corn or rice. By this time I was becoming faint, and in making the journey to the town was alarmed to find myself growing staggery and giddy. The ground ahead seemed to be rising up in front of me, and the little streams in the ditches on the sides of the road seemed to be flowing uphill. Then I realized that I was becoming dangerously hungry, and became more than ever anxious to receive that money package. To my delight, this fifth or sixth morning, when I inquired if the money package had come, the clerk replied that it had, but that he could not deliver it without my being identified. I said, Well, here, read my brother's letter, handing it to him. It states the amount in the package, where it came from, the day it was put into the post office at Portage City, and I should think that would be enough. He said, No, that is not enough. How do I know that this letter is yours? You may have stolen it. How do I know that you are John Moore? I said, Well, don't you see that this letter indicates that I am a botanist? For in it my brother says, I hope you are having a good time and finding many new plants. Now, you say that I might have stolen this letter from John Moore, and in that way have become aware of there being a money package to arrive from Portage for him. But the letter proves that John Moore must be a botanist, and though, as you say, his letter might have been stolen, it would hardly be likely that the robber would be able to steal John Moore's knowledge of botany. Now I suppose, of course, that you have been to school and know something of botany. 
examine me and see if I know anything about it. At this he laughed good-naturedly, evidently feeling the force of my argument, and, perhaps, pitying me on account of looking pale and hungry, he turned and rapped at the door of a private office, probably the manager's, called him out and said, Mr. So-and-so, here is a man who has inquired every day for the last week or so for a money package from Portage, Wisconsin. He is a stranger in the city, with no one to identify him. He states correctly the amount and name of the sender. He has shown me a letter which indicates that Mr. Moore is a botanist, and that although a travelling companion may have stolen Mr. Moore's letter, he could not have stolen his botany, and requests us to examine him. The head official smiled, took a good stare into my face, waved his hand, and said, Let him have it. Gladly I pocketed my money, and had not gone along the street more than a few rods before I met a very large negro woman with a tray of gingerbread, in which I immediately invested some of my new wealth, and walked rejoicingly, munching along the street, making no attempt to conceal the pleasure I had in eating. Then, still hunting for more food, I found a sort of eating place in a market, and had a large regular meal on top of the gingerbread. Thus my marching through Georgia terminated handsomely in a jubilee of bread. End of chapter 4